So here's um, identification session number three um, of, of four. And uh, tonight's little entree is the light crimson underwing, Apicala promissa, um, a species we'd all love to see turning up in our moth traps in our gardens. And I think I will include a little show of Apicala moths next week um, and how to separate them. Not that they're all difficult, but certainly light crimson underwing and dark crimson underwing are difficult. And um, they are becoming more widespread in southern Britain. And if they do anything like they've done in Europe, they're very likely to spread north. So uh, if you've ever felt, oh, well, I'll have to go all the way down to the southern England to Hampshire or somewhere to find them, it's possible you may well see them. And certainly dark crimson underwing seems to travel the country. Um, turning up as a as a wanderer, so who knows? It might turn up in your trap. Yeah. Right. So we're going to start now with a pair of species that um, I think are often confused, sometimes guessed, and we really ought to do our best to get them right. So that's the treble bar and the lesser treble bar. Now both of these species are. Uh, widely distributed in England, but it's, uh, and the lesser treble bar is very definitely rarer further west and further north. So in southwest England, lesser treble bar rarely, if ever, occurs. There may be a handful of records for Devon, but it's certainly not in Cornwall. A very, very few records that are confirmed in Wales. And once you get into northern England, it's in the east side of the country, so it's in Yorkshire. And it does get up to um, Lothian, so around the Edinburgh area, um, but otherwise is not not present. So so most of the time, if you're in the far north, you will be seeing treble bar. But that doesn't mean to say that you might not see lesser treble bar, because what we are finding with so many species is that they're starting to spread north and um, and west. And this could happen to lesser treble bar as well. Uh, just... So the treble bar and lesser treble bar, they've both got uh, similar food plants. They well, they both feed on the St. John's wort plants. So uh, perforate St. John's wort um, is, is, is a, a very regular food plant for both of these species. And both can occur in the same locations. In my experience in Dorset, I tend to find lesser treble bar on more sandy soils, um, and I find treble bar in all sorts of places. So it's, uh, I think, treble bar more ubiquitous than to treble bar in my part of the world, more on the heathlands and the, the sort of acid grassland soils that, uh, that we have in the east of the county. So um, what I'd like to do is just show you with my little pointer, my little highlighter, um, you can see, if we look at the top row of treble bar, we can see here, oh, that's yellow. We don't want yellow because it's not visible. Um, red. Here we go. Can you see the tip of the abdomen just pointing very, very slightly beyond the edge of, of the, of the, of the, uh, outer edge of the wing. You can't see it in the third specimen. That's because that third specimen is a female. But that's a clue as to how to separate these two species reliably. Now, most people and most books talk about the shape of the inner dark bar as to whether it is treble bar or it's a treble bar. So the inner dark bar is this one over here and this one here. So it's the shape of these bars. And it's a pretty good character, but I have to say it's not, in my view, 100% reliable. And so what I like to do is to look at the shape of that bar, angle of that bar, and then decide on the basis of other, which I think more reliable characters, which we should be using. So. Um, let me just, um, I think, 
Mm. Okay, so that's now looking at treble bar at the top, lesser treble bar at the bottom, and I picked the very best examples to illustrate the point. And the point is now, if you look at the shape of that, you can see the difference in the angle and the shape of the of that dark angled bar. And what you're really looking at is the what we call the outer margin of that. So it's this margin here and this margin here. And then it becomes pretty obvious that one has well, an angle, a proper angle on it, and the other one is rather nicely curved. So if it is properly curved, then it will be treble bar. And if it is properly angled, then it will be lesser treble bar. But I tell you, and I'm sure many of you who've been recording for many years will find some that you're going, mm. I can't really tell which it is. It's sort of got a bit of a curve, but it also has a bit of an angle. When you get those sorts of examples, that's when you need to be using other characters. And the main character that I use is the shape of the back end of the abdomen. So it's the claspers at the bottom end of the abdomen. The claspers are the, are the, the male genitalia, which are clasping the female. And it's the length of what we know as the valvi or the claspers. So that's the that's the two claspers, one on either side, and um, and in the lesser treble bar. Just make my things away. We've got a short version, and you see in the male you've got long valves. Okay, and in the in the male of the lesser treble bar you've got short valves, and that is. Uh, they're hugely different. And so that is a, a, a really reliable way of telling uh, these two species apart without ever having to worry too much about the four wing markings and the angle of the inner bar. So the shape and size of those male valvae. Now, the species can also be separated by examining the female abdomen. But sadly, I I haven't managed to source any photographs of the female abdomen that I can easily have got permission for us to use this evening. Let me describe it to you. If you look at the female abdomen of the treble bar, and you start at the where the body where the abdomen joins onto the thorax, you run your eyes down towards the the ovipositor, the back end, uh, about four fifths the way down, the body narrows quite quite dramatically into a, into basically a cylinder, a little tube. And then at the back end of the tube is the ovipositor. So so you can see there's a there's a, a distinct change in the shape of the abdomen and it becomes a sort of narrow tube. That begins. If you look at the lesser treble bar, there's just nothing like it at all. It just looks like an, an ordinary geometer moth abdomen. It's it's quite a squat looking body and it definitely doesn't have anything like this tube. Now, so there is a way without ever having to look at the four wings to be able to tell treble bar and the treble bar apart. Um, and I commend those characters to you. And if only I had the female uh, pictures to show you, I would do just that. So that's those two done. Erase the ink and move on. Right. Here's some lovely moths. Quite soon, we will be seeing some, and perhaps all, of these species. So on the left is purple thorn, in the middle is lunar thorn, and on the right is early thorn. And I would think almost anybody who's starting mothing, uh, when they put a moth trap out in end of March through April, they will see the species on the right, early thorn. Early thorn, it's very easy to recognize. It's pretty much our earliest thorn species to fly. And it sing, sits with its wings close together. And it, I, I don't know that I've ever seen them apart. And so it's very easy to identify and very difficult to get wrong. It also has a second generation that flies in the summer. And the individuals in that second generation in July are often a bit smaller, but they look pretty similar. Let's flip over to the left-hand side to the purple thorn. 
And in the spring, in April, perhaps early May, the uh, purple thorn is one of the most spectacular thorn moths that, that there is. It's a stunningly beautiful dark purplish brown with its uh, grey shading beyond uh, in the outer half of the wing. And it sits uh, with its wings rather like scrunched up leaves um, in a sort of boat shape. And I mean, it's, it's a remarkable moth. It's actually really quite hard to photograph to get the whole thing in focus, for instance, because it's so three-dimensional. Um, a wonderful species, and it's got these beautiful white lunules um, in the forewing and the and the hindwing in, in the middle, yeah, which you can see in the forewing and the hindwing. Now, that's the spring version. In the summer, the summer generation, um, where the summer generation occurs, this is, is the summer generation, um, are they're, they're, they're out in July, and they're a much paler version of it. So it's a, a, a sort of orangey, or orangey brown color with a um, hint of purple across across the wings. And it's it's probably a, a third smaller than the spring generation as well. So really quite a different looking moth from the spring and the summer generation. The one in the middle is Lunathorn. And Lunathorn, I love to see. It's, it's certainly, um, in my view, a much rarer species. I was just going to get my crib for... Um, working out just its distribution. Um, but um, Lunathorn is, 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 well, I find it extremely local. There are probably two or three woodlands where it occurs in Dorset, but it is widely distributed. Um, now, we need to be able to make sure that we can distinguish it from the spring generation of Purplethorn. It does fly slightly later normally, so I would expect to see Lunathorn the latter half of May and into June, whereas the purple thorn spring generation is really April and into May. But they undoubtedly overlap, and particularly in Scotland, you can easily get both species in the same trap in the same morning, but, uh, you know, by end of May, without a doubt. And the most obvious way to tell the two species apart is to look at the grayish outer, outer banding beyond the lunial and Look at the inner margin of that banding. And if that inner margin is kind of curved, then it's the purple thorn. And if it's almost straight, if it's almost straight, then it is the lunar thorn. And you can see that that uh, character is also reflected in the hind wing, is that the hind wing also has a curve in the purple thorn, but it's pretty much straight in the Lunathorn. Now, notice that I haven't said that there's a colour difference. And that's because no well, normally there is a colour difference. And that colour difference is pretty obvious, as it's seen on that slide. Um, if you are in the west of Scotland, then the Lunathorns, and particularly on the Isle of Skye, and the Lunathorn lives out on moorland on the Isle of Skye and probably elsewhere in western Scotland. And there, Color of the uh, uh, lunar thorns is spectacularly dark, like the purple thorns, or at least a proportion of the population are. It's a wonderfully rich, dark maroon color, and, and not, so nothing like the, uh, the the orangey brown that you would see elsewhere. So, so it's um, sometimes you will find weird and wonderful forms of species that that you need to rely not not on the color of the moth, but on the shape of the markings. I'm sure my identification sessions have always been trying to encourage you to look beyond the colours to to particular characters, and that's not just the um, pattern on the wings, but it's the wing shape and the way the wings are held and the time of year of appearance. It's all of these characters that help determine which species is which. Right. So those are the sort of three thorns that you might expect to see in the um, springtime and also repeated in the summer for the purple thorn and the early thorn. Purple thorn, by the way, is a rarity in Scotland. It's a central highlands thing, but it's it's much, much rarer in Scotland than it, than it is in England. But I'm also going to do two mid to late summer species, September thorn 
and August thorn, just because it fills up and makes a lovely, lovely showing of some very beautiful moths. Um, I think most of the time you'd back yourselves to be able to identify September thorn and distinguish it from August thorn. September thorn appears hmm, from the end of July, so don't just listen to its name. It appears from the end of July and then into August, and then there's a bit of a lull, and then it reappears in September. Now, we still don't really understand what's going on. Is that a proportion of the one population that's emerging you know, a, a month earlier? And, and then a, a later proportion, so a sort of dispersal in time as opposed to space? Or, or are these separate populations that we don't really understand much about? Anyway, there's something going on in September thorn that means quite a lot of them emerge in July. August thorn definitely emerges in August and then goes on into September and sometimes later. It's a bigger moth, so September thorn quite slender, August thorn uh, relatively full-winged, and you can see uh, beyond the outer line, beyond halfway, is that there's some nice shading beyond this outer line. There's some there's some shading of of a darker that that just doesn't occur in September thorn. There will be August thorn examples which are much plainer, and and therefore potentially one could overlook them in there. Now August thorn is um, is a species that's well, it's well distributed in England and Wales and in Ireland, but the further north you go, the much rarer it gets. So it is in it is just about in Scotland. It's in um, in uh, Dumfries and Galloway, on on the sort of south end of Scotland, and there are a few records from uh, the, the sort of central belt. But it's um, but it's very much a rare species. But it's you know it's one of those species that I think is likely to spread further north. It's uh, it likes beach. In beach woodlands, and and I think it's probably one of those species that's likely to spread north as time goes on. So if you are confused about how to tell these species apart, then um, then the way to do it is to look at the legs, because the, the color of the legs is completely diagnostic. You can see the September thorn; those legs are pretty much the same color as the forewings. They're yellowish. It's a little reflection from the camera. Um, but if you look at the August thorn on the right, you can see those legs are creamy white. White contrast, quite strongly contrasting with the color of the forewings. And so that's how you can always tell those two species apart. Okay, lovely looking at thorns. Right, moving on. Okay, we're now going to move into some noctuid moths, and we're going to look at, well, I think kind of a fascinating group. This um, this group that live on campions and catchflies and um, uh, sweet williams. Um, the, the, these are these are moths that almost have obligatory um, pollination with campion family with the Caryophyllaceae, with the pinks. And um, uh, so they're very important as pollinators. And in fact, they're very important as pollinators of a whole range of plants. So uh, the top species, Lychnis, is one that I think we find in all sorts of places. And I'll just get to my brain. Um, the Lychnis is pretty much um, all over the country. Um, and is widespread, and the main food plant of the Lychnis is red campion. So it's the sort of species you'd find on any road verge where you see red campion in flower, and it regularly turns up in gardens. It's quite a common moth. Rather more local is the campion moth, which is fe uh, featured below, and um, it's just worth us going through how we distinguish these two and for this i'm going to use laser pointer there are a number of features the first thing i think is pretty obvious to see is the champion moth has a broader forewing so the lickness is relatively neat quite fairly narrow but if you look at the width of the of the wings in the campion and the way it rests it's it's a broad species 
And that is that is a really important character not to forget when you're looking at one. The other thing, and in particular this example here, can you see there's a, a hint of lilac to the wings? Now, obviously, if the champion example that you've got in front of you is a bit worn, it might have lost that lilac hue to it. But that is a characteristic of the champion that is not present in the likeness. But there are some other features that we would uh, wish to use to confirm whether we've got weakness or campion. And the first one is to look at the, um, what we call the subterminal line. So that's the white wiggly line just for the outer edge of the wing. So I'm just going to trace over that now. So here's the subterminal line. Okay, that's the line. Okay, and we can see here that this line is is wiggly until it gets to near the the inner corner of the wing, and then it straightens up and heads effectively heading towards the thorax, meters out. Let's look at the same in the campion in the bottom photograph, and that too is wiggly, and it remains wiggly, totally wiggly, and it ends up at the bottom corner what we call the tornus, the, the meeting of the outer edge and the trailing edge of the wing. So you need to look at where that line ends up and does it remain very wiggly all the way throughout or does it, does it straighten and almost head towards the thorax before it peters out? So that's that character, the subterminal line character. Another feature, if we go back to the lickness, is the shape of the... Um, of, of the of the stigma of the stigmata, and if we look at the um, the a kidney shaped one, which isn't really kidney shaped in the lychnis, uh, or indeed in the campion, it's fairly it's lozengish, it's it, it's round, but it's a it's a regular shape. It's um, an oval, I think we'd call it. If you look at the same in the campion, it's kind of oval, but it's it's distorted uh, in the middle of the wing. It sort of seems to be extended, heading towards and almost joining up with the 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 the, uh, the round stigma, the orbicular stigma, and and that in a number of individuals is what happens. Is this extension actually does join, and you can see the white join with that uh, forward stigma. So that is a key feature of the campion. It's got this rather distended, odd shaped. Um, um, right. kidney shaped stigma. Okay, so that's how I would distinguish the two: the the purple shade or the broad wings, the, the 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 shape and direction of that uh, subterminal line, and the shape uh, and and uh, of the um, kidney shaped mark, and whether it joins onto the, uh, the oval, the oval stigma. So that is those two which I hope now you'll feel confident to be able to separate. Right, we're now going to move on to, well, I suppose it's a bit more ecology story, but a little bit of identification with it too. Um, Tawny Shears and Barrett's Marbled Coronet. Uh, I personally don't think you're going to have a great deal of difficulty in separating these two species, so I won't spend long on that, but I will give you the characters of it. If you are ever confused, then tawny shears has a, has a very neat look for the wings. It's um, it's a small species, and the markings are rather distinct, They're quite uh, quite well outlined. And the Barrett's barbel coronet is a rather longer wing species, and the markings are more diffuse. But what I really wanted to show you was just how variable these species are. So um, here are some set examples from around the country. That first tawny shears on the left is the form of the tawny shears that most regularly occurs in central parts of England um, and, and uh, over into, the, um, into East Anglia. Um, and it's wide, you know, relatively widespread, but, um, but the populations around the country vary quite considerably. So in the middle of the, so it's the top left of the set examples, that's the form that occurs in central southern England, or, or regularly occurs in central southern England. 
And it's completely different. It's a sort of, it's basically got a, ye a yellowish white um, background color and the markings are much more, um, uh, much more suffused. The top right is the, is the form that occurs at Dungeness in, in uh, Southeast Kent. And it has a white background with these sort of uh, brownish markings on it. And the one below is what um, some people refer to as the pod lover. Um, but more, I think the recent uh, DNA suggests that it's a form of the horny shears rather than a separate species. And that's a species that occurs and is pretty much coastal um, um, around the coast of Ireland and on the Isle of Man and in um, uh, parts of Scotland, but also heading down to um, Scilly Isles and onto the Channel Islands. So it seems to be a, a form of the species that seems to predominate in, in the west of Britain. Now, just, just so that we're aware, um, horny shears, if you go over to the top left photo, the, 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 the key feature that I think you ought to look for in horny shears are the black dagger mark, these little triangles. And there are usually three of them, not always, but, but usually three in the outer part of the wing. And those occur, and you can see them beautifully on the Dungeness form in the top right, these arrow marks that are char characteristic of the horny shears, and they don't occur on other things. What's interesting about this is why, for such a widespread species, do these forms occur and don't seem to interbreed? Is although these species are, well, this particular species is... Hmm, it's a lot less common than it was, but it's certainly still pretty common. Yet they seem to maintain faithfully the the color forms that they that are local to their geographic area. So it appears that here's a species that probably disperses very well where it occurs, but it doesn't do long distance dispersal. Um, and and I certainly think, from my point of view, you know, if 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 I live in an area as I have done where horny shears doesn't occur then it's not a species I will ever see. You know, it doesn't seem to wander around a great deal during its flight period. So I think these, these despite them being quite widespread, they seem to maintain these um, uh, polymorphic populations is that the, uh, a, a form will occur in one area, but definitely not in another. And the same happens with Barrett's marbled coronet. Is the form on the left is the form that... Um, uh, I discovered on the coast of Dorset, and um, uh, I was a. It, it's not dissimilar to the one that occurs in Devon, which is in the top right of the of the three of these photographs, but it is much much paler and more orangey than the bottom right, which is the form that occurs in Cornwall, and indeed the Cornish ones can go almost a sort of slate grey colour. So here again are, are individual forms, color forms of the species that seem to maintain themselves as quite separate identities. Um, and uh, it's interesting to think, well, how does, a, how does a form like that occur? If you look on the Channel Islands, then the form on the Channel Islands is very similar to the Cornish form, but it doesn't really look like the Dorset form. So how did that Dorset form evolve? How did it come to maintain itself like that? Um, and indeed, it's confined to a pretty small area of the undercliff uh, uh, to the west of Bridport. And, and it's, uh, you know, in the, the moth occurs in Devon. The Devon forms look much more like the, uh, the ones on the top right. So we have these um, really interesting, effectively subspecies, races of, this, of, of the species that occur despite the species occurring in lots of places, is they seem to maintain these uh, uh, population identities. And um, that's not something I think we think of commonly happening in moths, but it definitely happens in, in, this, in this group, and particularly in tawny shears and Barrett's marble coronet. Right, I thought I'd just add in fun is uh, small ranunculus. The small ranunculus is a species that uh, uh, was thought to be extinct in Britain, and has now spread back into um, in, in, into this country. Not quite sure how it got here. And uh, some people find small ranunculus. It does look 
similar wing shape to tawny shears, but it's got a it's kind of grayish, white gray, um, brown color with little yellowy yellowy orange flecks on it. And um, I mean, it's not a it's a species you would easily recognize if it turned up in your moth trap. Now, some people will say, well, I find lots of them every year now. It's become a common moth. I'm still waiting to see it in Torset. There have been a handful of records, and that's it in the county. And yet in Hampshire, it's now quite widespread. And I think in the home counties, it's it's a common moth. And I remember driving up the M40, no, at the north of Oxford to join the M40 and joining a queue of traffic, as I'm sure some people have done before, looking out the window and spotting the larvae on the great lettuce growing in the road verge. So they, they are clearly a species that is able to move around the country. Um, there's a population in South Wales. It's spread into the South Midlands. It's all over the sort of London and, and uh, home counties. And it's got, it's got, there's a population in the Liverpool, Manchester area and, and, uh, and spreading further west into, into South Yorkshire. Um, but it's, it definitely hasn't got to the Southwest yet. Uh, but it's a lovely moth, and um, uh, you know it's a similar shape to to uh, tawny shears, but really quite different in markings. Right now, we're going to move into wainscots because there are a bunch of species that are well. There's a lot. There's a lot happening in wainscots, and um, uh, uh, and one of those is right here, the white point moth, white point and clay. White point and clay are species that are. I would say probably quite regularly confused. Um, let me just see where White Point has got to now. White Point, when I was first trapping as a teenager, was a rare immigrant species. If I wanted to go and see it, I'd have to go to Cornwall. I'd have to go down to the lizard in the autumn, and I might be lucky enough to see them. Um, these days, White Point moth is now very definitely and firmly resident, and indeed is it extremely common. It can be the commonest wainscot moth um, in coastal counties uh, in, in the late summer. Um, clay, on the other hand, is very, very widespread in Britain, um, all the way up into Scotland. Not common in Scotland, but it's around quite widespread in Ireland. Um, and uh, it occurs, really, clay is around from, well, um, it's, it's around sort of midsummer. So it's a June july august moth um with a sort of peak in july and and white point occurs may all the way through to well i i've, I've seen them in november but basically may to october and it has two generations a year or possibly even a third um, but it's certainly got a very big peak in the second generation late on in late on in the year in in august september and into october if you look at the white point, think of the name, then it, it's got a white point. And, and the white point is dead white, and it's pretty much rounded. Compare that with the points in the clay wings, and you'll see that the clay point is rather extended. It's rather flattened, and it's creamy at best. It's not bright white. And so that's the key feature you're looking for. Um, the other thing is the overall shape of the moth. The clay is bigger. It has, I think, rather more pointed wings. And uh, when it sits, it tends to sit with its wings slightly more spread and the white point a little bit more neat. And and the, the um, if I just get my pointer, then if you look at the I always think the 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 edge of the wing of the uh, white point is is neatly cut off at the ends where it's it's rather more angled. So I suppose yeah, effectively I'm saying that the clay has a slightly more pointed wing than the white point. So we're looking for the shape of the white point in the clay and in the white point moth. And the other feature that I think is quite helpful, but not very helpful when you've got a worn example are the black dots beyond the white point in the clay. They are usually present, almost always present in clay. And there's nothing quite like it. You've got these faint hint of darker lines in white point, but there's nothing really. Your eye is drawn to the white point 
and that's about it in in the white point. So that's how you can tell white point from clay. And I would say expect to see white point spreading north and west in the next 10 years pretty rapidly. Um, I, I can't see what's going to hold it up, to be honest. It's a, it's a species that spread. It's well established in, in the southern part of England, just into Wales. And, and I expect it will become much commoner and become a, a common wainscot throughout England and Wales. On the right-hand side, I've included for fun uh, the double line. I don't expect anybody to have a problem identifying double line. It's the most beautiful, sumptuous, big wainscot moth with these two dark lines on each wing. Um, it's got a, a rather funny distribution. It's very definitely a species of wet grasslands in the west. So in southwest England and into Wales and just about getting up into uh, into Lancashire. Um, the further, and, and it's widespread. So if you were to go into, um, I don't know, a, a, a forestry forestry commission plantation where you've got uh, some rather frankly dull grassy rides, it's the sort of place in, in Wales where you'd see lots and lots of double line. So it's a, a common moth in, in rather mm, unexciting habitat conditions. Move further east, and I'm not talking about very further east, so into Dorset, and it becomes a species that is pretty much confined to ancient parkland. And the further east you go, that's even more the case. So it's um, on, uh, is it Richmond Common in, in London? Is about the only site in, well, one of the few sites in the London area where it's still in the grasslands among the old ancient oak trees which is exactly the same in Dorset. It's a species that is very definitely one of ancient parkland. But the further west you go, it becomes a species of pretty much any grassland in uh, roast pasture. So some of the up, slightly more upland grasslands in the southwest and also those uh, wet grasslands in woodlands. And quite why that is, I don't think we understand, but uh, it's a species that just seems to like it, um, seems to like it wetter. But a lovely moth, um, and it is prone to wandering. So uh, you could expect to see double line pretty much anywhere. Um, and certainly in the last five to 10 years, more examples seem to be wandering more frequently than we, the, we previously noted. So it is a species, to, you know, don't be too surprised if you'd suddenly see double line turning up in your moth trap. Right, so there's that. Right, let's move on to... Um, some species that are oft missed, oft misidentified. And I'm talking about common wainscot and smoky wainscot. Um, I, I think we think of the names, well, the common wainscot, it's bound to be common, therefore I'm going to find it. True. Smoky wainscot, oh, well, that's the one with the smoky hind wings, therefore that's easy to record. I just jam a pencil under the hind wing, have a look, and if it's smoky, smoky wainscot. Not true. And on the right-hand side is southern wainscot, and we'll have a look at that too. So the thing I want you to go away with this evening, if you have ever wondered about identifying common and smoky wainscot, is wing shape. And as soon as I say wing shape, it becomes blindingly obvious why I'm doing it. It's, to me anyway, it is obvious that the wing shape of the common wainscot is pointed, there. Okay, just as it just as we were talking about for clay and white point, and for smoky wainscot, is much less pointed, much more like white point. And that is a key feature, however warm the example is, that you should be able to see. And you can see how neatly cut off the wings are on the smoky wainscot and how pointed they are in the common wainscot. Now, there are other features and the uh, amount of darker shading below the center, um, center vein, if it's a, you know, really is quite deeply shaded with the cutoff wings, then that's more likely to be smoky wainscot, the common wainscot. But actually you do find common wainscots with that shading below that central line. So I don't find that a particularly helpful character. Okay, so that's 
So that's um, hard to distinguish smoky wainscot from common wainscot, but I just want to do a little bit more than that um, because here's two set examples. And I think, well, I hope you can instantly see that wing shape difference is that the pointed wing in the common wainscot. But notice how common wainscot, which we usually think of as having a plain, almost pearly white hind wing, doesn't always have that pearly white hind wing. Here's an example which has got a dusty, sooty hind wing, and that, you know, in the half light of the morning, you could easily record that as smoky wainscot, because rather like the smoky wainscot below, it's got smoky colored hind wing but please don't because that doesn't help the records and why this matters i mean i you know in some respects these are both common species but why it matters is because the smoky wainscot is a has a single generation a year it's an obligate single generation species a year i don't say that second generation individuals haven't been recorded but Almost all of them are one generation, and it's a moth that flies from June to August. Yes, there might be a bit of a tail into early September, but I do wonder about the validity of some of those records. Common wainscot, on the other hand, definitely has two generations a year and is also prone to wandering in from the continent. We can see common wainscot from May all the way into late October and possibly even early November. Uh, a few individuals. So it's a species that has a peak in the in, in the early summer and then a peak again, particularly in August and September. Clearly there will be an overlap all summer with common wainscot and spoky wainscot because it is a common moth. Um, uh, but but I, I urge you to to look carefully as to which you've got, whether it is common or smoky wainscot. Yes, I know they're both common species. But we really ought to be making sure that we get them correctly identified. OK, we're now going to look at the difference between uh, smoky wainscot and southern wainscot. OK, so um, uh, the, the, the wing shape difference is important, um, uh, just, just, as, just as it is with the common wainscot and smoky wainscot. But it's just a bit more difficult to describe. Actually, there's a very slight point to the way. It's, it's, it's got a very slight sort of apex to it, um, uh, uh, reduced to a point, which isn't really present in smoky wainscot. I mean, that's quite a subtle character, but it does give you the impression of the southern wainscot being a broader wing species. But there are other much more helpful characters. Southern wainscot, by the way, is a species that is, um, yeah, from given its southern distribution, it's a species that's throughout the whole of England and throughout most of Wales, well, no, yeah, most of coastal Wales, and up into northwest England. It gets uh, just about into Scotland in Dumfries, uh, yes, into Dumfries, and there are one or two records in um, in in the uh, in Lothian. Um, but uh, it's a species that is uh, very definitely associated with reed beds and um, and common reed. Uh, but it's it is spreading north. So, yeah, I, um, if you look at the, the the moths here, you can see that the hind wing of the uh, southern wainscot in the top has is quite white, but it has a row of dots uh, running through the middle of the wing. And obviously, the smoky wainscot doesn't. The key feature that just should be able to get it every time is to look at the front end of the southern wainscot because it has a visor and it has a black and white visor. They don't always look quite as spectacular as that, but, um, but uh, uh, you can usually identify three dark lines and three pale lines just above the eyes, so on the front edge of the thorax, and, and these other wainscots, the common and the smoky wainscot, don't have that at all. Okay, so I'm now going to do two other wainscots um, together, and that's common wainscot with Matthew's wainscot. Now, most continental 
authorities don't recognize Matthew's wainscot as a separate species from common wainscot. Um, however, in this country, we do, and I wholeheartedly approve of that. Um, Matthew's wainscot is a salt marsh species, um, and it's a salt marsh species that occurs in uh, Dorset, around Poole Harbour, in the salt marshes around the Isle of Wight and Hampshire, um, up into uh, West Sussex, and then it's on um, Kent coast and around into the Suffolk, Suffolk marshes, so Essex and Suffolk. And what's different about this species is the um, it's the colour of the wings instantly. If you look at the top common wainscot, you'll see that's that um, sort of pale yellow brown straw colour. Look at these two Matthews wainscots. One's kind of got a hint in the middle there, pinkishness, and the other one's quite orangey. That orangey form is is relatively uncommon, and most of them are quite pinky. Um, what is it is perhaps you're starting to see there is actually the color of the wings and also the markings on those wings, however subtle they are, is really important. And again, so I've got the top example here is a common wainscot and the two below are Matthew's wainscots. And if you look at the center vein of the um, common wainscot, so that's this, this, this whitish vein here. If you look at that vein, Compare that in the Matthews wainscot examples below, and you can see that the you can see a contrasting colour that it's very much straw coloured in common wainscot with the darker um, uh, yellowish brown in between the veins, where in the Matthews wainscots they're all the same colour. There's perhaps just a little bit of shadow difference. That's all there is. Is that the the, the scales colour of the scales is uniformly spread over the wings. I also think there's actually even a subtle wing shape difference is actually Matthew's wainscot is often even more pointed winged than common wainscot. And why I think this is important, and, and you know, I've got, I've got a bit of a thing about this, is that here we have a, a species that appears to have evolved in the presence of a very common species. And it's not, it's not a, an evolutionary distinction that's happened over millions of years. It's a distinction that has happened probably over several thousand generations, perhaps since the last ice age, but is very definitely a species that, while its DNA may not be significantly different from common wainscot, all the indications are from its behavior and the fact that it maintains this color pattern without any in, without any integrates it, it maintains these forms so it's maintaining itself as ecologically isolated from common wainscot even if genetically it's 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 impossible to tell them apart basically the dna doesn't tell you everything and you need to look at the ecology of the species to say well is this behaving as a separate species or is it not so it is behaving as a separate species because it is a species that lives and breeds on salt marshes. It also shows subtle, but I think quite distinct morphological differences, as in the color of the wings. That the, and the overall look of the moth is a quite of a smooth, silky finish to the wings, which you definitely don't get in common wainscot. So I, I am very happy to treat these as separate species on the basis of those characters even though the DNA looks absolutely identical. Basically, they haven't had a million and a half years to separate themselves. They've had perhaps since the last ice age, you know, perhaps uh, 10,000 years, but they are behaving as separate species. And there, just to show you a couple of enlargements again, and you can see very distinctly in the common wainscot, those pale, the pale scaling on the veins and how that pale scaling isn't there in Matthew's wainscot. Okay, now how are we doing time-wise? We are now uh, not far off. Um, right, um, another species that's spreading rather rapidly, and I think um, I, I wouldn't have included this a few years ago, Radford's flame shoulder and flame shoulder. Here's a Radford's flame shoulder is a species that turned up, um, it was, I think I'll just have to look up the first record for you. First record was in West Sussex in 1983. Um, and, you know, for 
all the way up to the last few years, we deal with perhaps 100 individuals in the country. Now we're dealing with thousands of them. And, and they're still pretty coastal, but last autumn, they started to spread inland. And it seems to be to be yet another species that before long, we're going to have to uh, think about quite hard as to how we distinguish Redford's flame shoulder from flame shoulder, because I think it's a species that's very likely to establish and spread throughout the country. It is certainly now breeding on the Channel Islands, and it, um, uh, well, not that I've found larvae on there, but, but there are two generations a year turning up regularly on the Channel Islands. It's no longer an immigrant species. And there are summer individuals, a very few of them turning up in Dorset, in Portland, and then a large number in the autumn. Quite how that's happening, we don't really know. Here's how to distinguish them. The first thing to notice is that Radford's flame shoulder has a longer forewing. Uh, and and uh, overall, it just looks a more slender moth. It's a bigger, but a more slender moth. You can see how flame shoulder in the bottom row is actually quite variable. Um, I think uh, one of the characters that's used often is the size of the stigmata, the, in particular the oval in the Radford's flame shoulder is usually smaller than the oval in a flame shoulder. Well, it's okay but I'm not sure that I kind of buy it too much because flame shoulder is really quite a variable moth. And, and I think just to record on that basis wouldn't particularly be helpful. So what character are we going to use? We need to be using the, um, uh, we need to be using the one or two key characters that I think are really, really helpful. And that is the, the, um, the black center line that runs through the stigmata in the Radford's flame shoulder is extended as an arrow, okay, but is just a little dark dot in the flame shoulder. And that seems to me to be consistent in all the individuals that I've seen. The other key pointer is if you can or if you're going to use some carbon dioxide and, and knock the moth out for a few seconds, you can see that the color of the scales on the upper part of the abdomen in the Radford's flame shoulder, white and in the um, flame shoulder are, are a, 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 a yellowish brown color. So those are the two features that I would use every time, plus the fact that this looks uh, a rather longer winged moth. Okay. to erase all that. Fine. Um, and then just to show you a couple of freaky examples of uh, flame shoulder, just to show you how variable it is. And if you look at that bottom left flame shoulder and then compare that with the um, uh, Radford's flame shoulder at the top, you know, it would be so easy to record that as a Radford's flame shoulder, but it isn't because it doesn't share those key features of the arrow the, uh, extending the black line towards the outer edge of the wing, and it doesn't have white scales on the abdomen. But just looking at the four wing characters quickly, you could easily have recorded that as a Radford's. And then on the right hand side is just something weird where the flame, as in the whitish tree along the leading edge of the wing, has all but disappeared in that example. So flame shoulder, quite a variable moth. Right. Um, I think. I think we might leave it there, leave because we're now at eight o'clock, or do we want to? I mean, how are people doing? People still like some more? This could take 10 minutes. What do you reckon, Rebecca? Well, I think you started the actual kind of presentation oh, maybe 10 minutes yeah. late. So if you want to keep Did going I? for 10 minutes, yeah. that's fine. Oh, I would love to keep going for 10 minutes, but I hope you can stay with me. Right. We're going to do some footman now. Um, so hold on to your coattails. Um, common footmen, scarce footmen, and hoary footmen. In our part of the world, I would say these can be reliably identified. I wouldn't like to say the same if I were holidaying in southern France or Spain later on in the year. Well, I have to say, when I've tried to identify scarce and hoary footmen, I get a right old tangle. They all look 
there's so much variation. I, without probably detecting the genitalia, I couldn't do them. But let's stick with where we are in the northern part of Europe and go for it. The 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 common footman, um, uh, the, and the, the common the scarce footman, I think are pretty straightforward to identify in our part of the world, and that's the shape of the of the way that they sit the wing, the the way the wings are folded around the abdomen when the moth is at rest. Okay, so if you particularly look at that bottom left common footman, you can see that the wings are quite spread out, held flat over the abdomen. Compare that with a scarce footman, and they are rolled around the abdomen. And that is a clear and easy way to distinguish the dark gray forewing with the leading edge that's got a kind of a yellowy color. The, 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 the way that that yellow color is extended is also important to distinguish common footman from scarce footman, because in the common footman, it tapers to the apex of the wing at the corner where it's not easy to see in the examples that I've got here, but the yellow color goes all the way, the same width, all the way out to the, to the apex of the wing. So it's a, it's a solid band that doesn't taper. So if you've got a tapering band, it's a common footman. If you've got a non-tapering band, it's a scarce footman. And that's it. Moving from scarce footman to hoary footman, it gets a bit more subtle, um, but overall, in our part of the world, hoary footman is a paler version of scarce footman, basically. You don't get dark grey forewings in hoary footman, and you don't get the same colour contrast with that leading pale edge to the wing. Everything's all just a bit more muted and subtle, and you can see that from these two examples that I've got. So if you've got this... It's almost a kind of silvery gray, isn't it? Um, with a with a hint of a darker yellow uh, leading edge to the wing, then that's going to be hoary footman. Now, hoary footman, uh, in terms of its distribution, and indeed um, all of these um, all of these species, um, they are. Oh, let's get to my career. Mm -mm -mm. Um, the the footman, well the. Common footman is pretty widespread until you get into Scotland when it becomes a bit coastal. Uh, scarce footman is very definitely England and Wales, but it gets up into uh, southern Scotland in Dumfries and Galloway. And hoary footman, hoary footman is spreading. It used to be a species that was resident pretty much southwest England. Whether it was ever resident in Dorset, we don't quite know, but certainly Devon, Cornish coast, um, round to South Wales, St. David's, um, and on the on the uh, on the Scilly Isles and in uh, parts of South Southern Ireland. But now it's become established in the home counties, particularly in the Thames Estuary and Kent, Sussex, Surrey, and it's spreading further north. It's certainly into Berkshire and bits of Oxfordshire. Um, so it's a species that just in the last 10, 15 years seems to have got itself established and is very much an inland. It's got nothing to do with the coast at all there. Um, and so people can regularly show me examples of hoary footmen from those areas and go, well, I, I never see the moth in Dorset. So I have, I think, once seen it as a migrant moth that's come over from the channel, but it hasn't yet established widely in Dorset. Um, and just seems to occasionally turn up as, a, as an immigrant. So that's how to tell those three apart. And I think just for the last, yeah, for the last slide, I will look at dingy footmen and buff footmen in particular. Um, uh, and, and for fun, include four spotted footmen. We'll do four, four spotted footmen first. That's a species that has become uh, widely established throughout southern England now and into South Wales, all the way up into East Anglia, and you know, up into uh, North Midlands. So uh, there are, I think it's, it wouldn't surprise me if it hasn't been recorded in Scotland, it won't be long until it is. But it, it was a species that was very much a, a wanderer from the continent, occasionally establishing in coastal locations, but now pretty widespread. And when it does become established in a woodland near you, it can become spectacularly abundant. You, know, you can have hundreds in a morning in moth trap 
until all the parasites and diseases are caught up with it and then it gets a bit rarer. Um, but it's got these amazing blue reflective legs. So they're black legs, but the uh, the light that reflects um, is, is it kind of gives off a bluish hue to it. And um, so they're very easy to identify. Obviously, the female on the right has got four spots. The male has got this rather um, two-tone look to it, a sort of a yellowish-orange uh, uh, thorax that bleeds into the base of the wing, and then that fades into a sort of mixed grey across the rest of the wing. And the, part of the reason for mentioning that is if you're thinking footman, you need to think not only markings, and shape of wings, but you need to think color of legs. So hold that in your mind. Right, let's pop over to dingy footman on the far left, and we're going to be saying wing shape. The wing shape is like a melon seed, or if you prefer it, a cucumber seed. Anything in the cucurbitaceae, it's got that shape to it. And so when you see that moth, if it reminds you of a melon seed, it's going to be dingy footman. There are two forms of the dingy footman. The top is the standard gray form. And then below that is a Strominiola, the yellowish form, but it's still dingy footman. It's a, it's, a, it's a polymorphism. And a lot of these footmen are becoming extremely common. They've increased many thousand percent in their population distribution. So, so who, who knows where dingy footman, if you've never seen dingy footman before, it's certainly well up into northern England. Um, it's just been recorded in Scotland. My guess is it won't be long before it's a regular, a regular denizen of the central lowlands in Scotland around between Glasgow and Edinburgh. I can't see why not. It's spreading fast northwards. Next door is buff footman. Again, think wing shape. The wing shape difference is a bit subtle. In, uh, between the species is the male is in the top there and that has more of the wing shape of the four spotted footman than it does of, of, of a dingy footman it's quite a sleek slender straight edged look to it rather parallel sided to the leading edge of the wings the female buck footman below they're much more like the common footman in shape and indeed the wing markings are rather different in fact I've got a common footman there. There are undoubtedly, and particularly if you go into Southern Europe, buff footmen and common footmen that from the wing pattern look almost identical. And you can see from the left-hand buff footman, female, and looking at the common footman, if you look at the leading edge of the wing, you can see how it's got that um, yellowish leading edge. And if you imagine that buff footman female to be dark gray, then how would you tell that from the common footman? And there are plenty of examples in Southern Europe where the female buff footman has got those very dark gray forewings with the yellow leading edge, and yet they are buff footmen. And are we going to tell them apart? Well, I remind you, legs. Um, oh, well, I also, yeah, I'll do legs. Um, Legs are really important. The common footman, always somewhere on it, has bicolored legs. They are dark in places and yellow in other places, whereas buff footmen are either all dark gray or all black, but they're pretty much all one color. They certainly haven't got any contrasting yellow on them. Um, the other thing I was going to do was just to point out that if you do knock them out with carbon dioxide and you look at the underside of the forewing of the common footman, you can see it's two-tone. It's got a gray center area and a broad yellowish, pale yellowish outer area. And in the buff footman, if it's a pale form of the buff footman, then it's all one color on the underside of the forewing. But if it's one of those really dark gray females, then the whole of the underside of the of the forewing is dark gray apart from the cilia the outer edge of those scales which are yellow and so it's a really strong contrast between that and the common footman okay look i am going to leave it there um, and i will add these wonderful things to next week um those those larvae because i think that's probably going to take me another 20 minutes to go through
but you're going to have that as your excitement for next week to look at some wonderful caterpillars. Okay, well, look, thank you so much. Um, uh, I hope you've enjoyed that and found that useful.